Welcome back everybody, I'm Kalani. In this video, I'm gonna be showing you and uh, talking a little bit about uh, several clinical improvisation techniques that are unique to the profession of music therapy. However, uh, the techniques themselves are not unique to music therapy. How we use them is somewhat unique and how we maybe talk about them and apply them. But uh, any of you, anybody who facilitates music with other people or just plays with other people could use these techniques. So I wanna share with you from my music therapy perspective and also as a drummer, percussionist and facilitator of music for many, many, many years with many, many groups of people. Welcome to World Drum Club, I'm Kalani Das. So there's a few techniques you can take away from this. And like I said, if you, um, no matter what you do, if you're a teacher, you're an educator, you're a facilitator, or you're a music therapist, uh, you can use these techniques. So one of the first ones, and the most important techniques, and I just used this today in one of my sessions, is called grounding. And grounding is providing a rhythm or groove, or you can call it a vamp or an ostinato if you want to be fancy. It's basically just a, a beat uh, or a what we call a rhythmic ground. And um, you can think of the, the ground, the rhythmic ground, as creating a play space, right? Create a container, uh, as sometimes it is referred to. Let me make an analogy between a tennis court, right? You want to play tennis, you got rackets, you got balls, but where are you going to play? You can't really play tennis without the court. And what is the court? It's just lines on the ground, right? The ground is the ground, and, but as soon as you put lines on it, in a certain shape and dimension, and you put a net across there, now you can play tennis because the court is there. Uh, that's the difference between a tennis court and, a, and concrete, <laughs> just a ground. So in, in a similar way, we want to play music, but what are we going to play? We don't know. Where is the music? What, what music are we playing? Well, as soon as I do this, now the lines are down, right? Now there's a court there. There's a play space that has been defined. Right? And I'm predefining it. I'm saying, Here's, here we go. And now you can jump in. And when, we, uh, when people are, are presented with a, with a groove, or in this case, a rhythmic ground, often their reaction is, okay, I hear it. I'm, it sounds familiar now because I've heard that repeat a few times. And that generally gives people a sense of uh, comfort, actually, confidence, predictability, which all trying to translate into safety, right? Uh, predictability, repetition. Uh, that's one reason we repeat the same things over and over a lot of the time, is it takes people time to find their bearings. So what, what is a rhythmic ground or a, you know, or a beat or a groove? It can be something as simple as a pulse. It can be just a pulse. And maybe that's enough. It can also be a meter or a cycle, and what, how, what defines meter? Accents. In the shortest way, shortest way I could say possible, what defines meter? Accents. So if I, if I play, one, two, three, one, two. So now we have a, a three meter, right? Or a waltz rhythm. If I accent differently, right? Now it's a two feel. So the accents, the, the tones that you use, the timbre, it could be pitches, uh, that defines the meter and therefore could define the types of songs we sing or the, the ways we move, how we feel, and all of that factors in. It's also something that we consider. But let's just stick with the basics right now. So we have a rhythmic ground. And that creates an inviting musical environment. And then people can just join in however they like, you know, however they feel. So that's the number one thing from today, from this video, is rhythmic ground. Now, what do you need to be able to do to effectively produce a rhythmic ground? Well, you've got to be able to keep time, play the instrument, get at least one or two good tones out of it, quality tones. When we're talking about drumming, we're talking about maybe a bass tone, a low tone, and a middle tone, open tone, a higher tone, just a couple different tones, and you want to be able to play them consistently and produce them, you know, the way you imagine, the way you want to produce them, so it's not just random. 
Uh, and then you want to be able to keep that uh, rhythm. So play the rhythm, play the sounds, play it steadily, you know, so that it feels solid. And then also as, a, as another thing, um, you want to have some fortitude, which means you want to be able to hold that rhythm no matter what else is happening, because a lot of the time other stuff is happening. Uh, it's like riding a horse, right? You can get on the horse, but can you stay on the horse when people are trying to knock you off or spraying you with water or, you know, other things. They're prodding you and they're trying to knock you off. That's called fortitude, uh, your ability to maintain the rhythm, even while you're talking. So something you can try uh, now, you know, wherever you are, um, is see if you can play a groove and talk at the same time. That's a way to test your own inner fortitude and then uh, maybe have a conversation with somebody else while you're talking. So that's a, a way that you can sort of, you know, assess where you are, what your skills are, and what your uh, rhythmic fortitude is, your rhythmic abilities. But I'm going to assume that you can do all that because I want to get on to the other techniques. So um, here's another one. Banga lafia ashe ashe Banga lafia ashe ashe Banga lafia ashe ashe Banga lafia ashe ashe All right, can you sing a song while you're playing a groove? And um, that's actually another technique we call that modeling. And modeling is just doing something that you um, would like or you want to offer the option for other people to do. You're not asking them to do it. You're just doing it. In this case, sing the song. I'm singing the song. I'm not teaching you the song. I'm not telling you to sing the song. I'm just singing the song. So when, when we do that, when we just put something out there, we, we, we go into song. Uh, it's just a way, we call that modeling, which is just doing the thing that we hope or we want to make an offer for other people to also join us and do. All right, so let's pick it up from there. Funga la fia, ashe, ashe. 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 Funga la fia. Funga la fia. Funga la fi what? <laughs> All right, so that, a little bit of goofiness, uh, was another technique. And I'm kind of combining two there, but I'll, I'll, I'll break them apart for you. So the main technique I was, I was employing right there is called making spaces or leaving spaces. Creating a space to be filled. And that's an elicitation technique we elicit participation by setting up a structure, in this case, a song that has kind of a call and response, call and response, and then we leave a space. And what's your response? Funga la fia, ashe, ashe. Funga la fia. All right, so you now have heard the song, and hopefully, by leaving the space, you feel compelled to fill it in. And you know how to fill it in by saying ashe ashe. Also key, very easy. So the response is very easy. And I also not only left a space there, but I did another technique. You see, everything we do is purposeful. It's not just random. Another technique, which is called prompting, uh, which was, I gave you a little what? Uh, in other words, I'm asking you a question there. So I'm really asking you, for a response. So it wasn't just leaving a space. You could just leave a space and see what happens. But sometimes I like to prompt people with a little nudge. And that could be facial expression. Hmm? What? Hmm? <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying? Uh, or a word um, or a gesture like that. So there's little things that we do to promote participation 
Uh, and those can all happen together, right? None of these techniques are discrete. Uh, they're not happening individually, they're happening in a constellation. Because also, of course, while I'm doing this modeling and making spaces and prompting, I'm also doing the first thing that we talked about, right, that I showed you, which was rhythmic grounding. All right, so we have a lot of things we're doing together, and all of that is aimed at participation, uh, enjoyment, you know, eliciting participation uh, in different ways at different times from the participants, and it can be it can be very playful. Hopefully, it is playful. That's why they call it playing music. Um, and it's effective, right? We want that to be effective. And also, on top of everything we just talked about, so that's what we're doing, but on top of all that, remember that um, nothing, none of this is prescriptive, so it's things that we try, because this is a clinical, improvisation, humanistic experience. We don't know exactly how people are going to respond to all these things we're doing, so we try things out, and if they have, the, I mean, they're going to have a result, there'll be a response or no response, which is also a response. So everything you get back from your participants is always information that will inform what you do next or how you might change or modify what you're doing, which could include doing more of the same, modifying what you're doing, or just stopping what you're doing and doing something else. So we always have options. Um, the key is to just be open, pay attention, try things out, use the techniques, make modifications, do your best, and just serve your clients in the best way you can by making modifications, um, additions. You can make things more complicated or add to what you're doing. You can also uh, reduce the complexity of any activity, and just make it easy. Maybe just go to sounds and not even have any specific words, for example. All right. I'm gonna wrap up this video, but I'd like to know what you think of these techniques. Have you used them? Do you have any questions about them? These all fall under clinical improvisation techniques. They are music therapy techniques. However, you can see that they're not exclusive um, actions or techniques that, you, that only exist in music therapy. I'm sure many of you, uh, if you're doing group drumming, community drumming, these could also feel familiar to you, or certainly as a music educator, um, these could also feel very familiar to you, and maybe you already use these in your own way. So if you do, put it in the comments. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me through patreon.com slash Kalani. I will also be presenting an ongoing community drumming facilitation course through that Patreon page, patreon.com slash Kalani. If you're interested in that, if you'd like to learn more and study with me, you can do that over there. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy making music with your participants and you've uh, gotten something out of this video. If you have, please show it by liking, subscribing, hit the bell, because it's fun to hit bells. I do it a lot. All right, I'll see you guys next time. I'm Kalani, this is World Drum Club. Thanks for watching.